uh, for writing my new book. And I would say, first of all, it's a compilation of my life's work. You know, I don't know what else I have left to say after this, frankly. <laughs> but I, I always seem to find something to talk on about. Um, but when I wrote my first woman's book in 1998, um, it was to, to provide women with more information. It's when hormone replacement therapy was all the rage. And no one was really talking about the risks. So I just felt women need to have, needed to have more information about what options were available. So obviously my focus would have been on what natural medicines and naturopathic treatments were available. And if women did decide to take hormone replacement therapy, maybe what would be safer choices. Um, so fast forward. 20 some odd years, and my motivation and purpose really hasn't changed. Um, it's to really provide information on the differences, not only in the diseases that women are more susceptible to, but how women metabolize drugs differently than men. So that you can just make more informed choices, shall we say, and be in more active participation uh, with your healthcare practitioner. Because it really is about just you actively participating in your own health. Don't just accept, you know, what you're told. You know, try to learn, ask questions, don't be afraid to ask. And so, when I started writing this book, I started looking at some of the differences, like the disparity um, between men and women in clinical trials. And this is really what got me inspired, motivated, irritated, all of those things. Um, so sex and gender differences. And every cell in the body has a sex. And that means that men and women are different, even down to a cellular level. This also means that diseases and treatments and chemicals affect sexes differently. And what are some of those differences? Well, obviously, you know, the XXXY chromosome. Nobody can argue that. Uh, differences in brain structure. Higher percentage of body fat in women. So chemicals and pesticides and all the things we're exposed to like to hang out in the body fat. So women may be more susceptible to the toxins in our environment than men because of the higher fat content. Gut physiology and transit time. It takes longer for things to pass through the gut, so drugs will stay in a women's system longer than men. And of course, our hormones. So historically, the words, a little bit of terminology housekeeping here, historically the terms, because there's all this stuff out there today around gender, the word gender. And historically in science and in clinical trials, the words sex and gender have been used interchangeably, rightly or wrongly. <coughs> Okay? Like uh, with my book, it's called Women's Health Matters, the Influence of Gender on Disease. Well, I can't really say the influence of sex on disease, you know, because that would be misinterpreted in another way. So really what I'm talking about is how, wh how some diseases are more common in women and why, and why drugs might behave differently in women. It really has nothing to do with these terms, it's just, you know, on the clinical trials. Um, so the sex and gender gap in clinical trials. Another quote, the science that informs medicine routinely fails to consider the crucial impact of sex and gender. And this hampers our ability to identify these important differences that could benefit the health of all. Not just women, but men as well. And so just a little bit of history. So in 1970s, Women of childbearing ages were excluded from clinical trials. Now that was done without malice, because for those of you that remember the lidomide, you know how babies were born, you know, with limbs deformed, and then the deep diethylstibestrol, the drug that was given to women, and then their offspring had um, more risk of cancer. So the, it was a, it was initially done to prevent that. But what happened is that elimination basically ended up eliminating all women of childbearing age, whether they had no intention of having children on the birth control pill or minority groups, 
and basically right up through menopause. So women have been underrepresented historically, even today. And 1994, you know, they're starting to recognize that this was hurting and, and affecting women's health in a negative way. So the U.S. passed a law saying that na the National Institute of Health, which is the biggest single funder of all clinical research, had to include women in their trials. And, and this is the key point, the results had to be analyzed by sex and gender. Because that's the key. If you've got men and women in a trial, what's the point, really, of, of having both men and women in a trial unless you tell the differences in how this drug and treatment affected men and women differently? And so fast forward again, up until 2011, even now, when women are included, more so, about 34%, um, sometimes up to 40, but usually the average is about 25% of the representation in clinical trials are women. But only a third of the trials analyze it between sex, analyze the differences in the sexes. So just because there's no obvious anatomical differences, it doesn't mean that we don't need to be aware of how these treatments and drugs affects the cells, the XXXY cells in the body. Um, and so this not only affects you know, the clinical trials and the outcomes and the results that we get and everything that medicine is based on, it also affects how we respond to drugs. Acetaminophen, your over-the-counter Tylenol, takes 60% longer to be flushed out of a woman's body than a man's. 60% longer. Remember what I said about transit time. And then Ambien is one of the most popular sleeping medications in the US. And our equivalent here is called Sublinox. And I would think, and I'm just using sort of common sense when I say this, if, it, if Ambien as a sleeping medication has this effect, then I would say that probably most other sleeping meds are the same because of transit time and body fat in women. But the FDA finally in 2013 cut the dose in half for women because what they found is that women were at greater risk for accidents because they were impaired much longer. 15% of women were still impaired eight hours later after taking the drug as opposed to two to three percent of the men. They knew this in 1992 before the drug went on the market. It took 21 years for the dosage to be changed. So it's not that I'm going to stand up here and tell you what drugs are safe and what treatments are safe. Frankly, I don't know if anyone really knows until we start assessing and analyze the clinical trials by, by sex you know, by our biology, if we want to use a neutral term. Um, and so it's just a matter of understanding this. And if you're <coughs> reacting to a drug, then start talking to your physician, your healthcare practitioner, about decreasing your dose. Eight out of 10 drugs pulled from the market um, between, or sorry, eight out of 10, yeah, 80% of the drugs pulled from the market between 1997 and 2005 were because of side effects in women. So it's really important that you know, we start getting the word out. And I think really it's going to be a bottom-up education. You know, because a lot of medical doctors aren't even aware of the extent of the disparity. Um, and one of the advocates of trying to get more women in clinical trials is a medical doctor that I really respect for this. He is, I'm paraphrasing, but he said our knowledge of how drugs and treatment affect the XXXY cells in the body today is equivalent to our knowledge of anatomy in the 16th century. So we're a little bit behind the time. And then some of the conditions that affect women differently or that women are more prone to, cardiovascular disease present, presents differently. And that awareness is starting to come out, but it's still not where it needs to be. And the greatest mortality rate right now is younger women, women in their 50s. And one in five women under the age of 55 do not experience chest pain. So what happens is they're misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and sent home, and so there's a higher rate of mortality. So in, my, in the book, 
I, you know, outline the signs to look for that women experience that say that is not your typical signs of a heart attack, okay? Um, so Alzheimer's disease, 72% of people with Alzheimer's are women. Um, diabetes, the outcome is poor for women with diabetes because they are at um, a much higher risk, five to six times higher risk for cardiovascular disease than men with diabetes, or two or three times the risk. Anxiety and depression, 60 to 75 percent more likely in women. Now, in all fairness, that could be related to the fact that men don't talk about it. You know, they're not going to really say, oh, I'm, I'm depressed, or, you know, they just get grumpy and irritable and, you know, kind of carry it. You know, so women are more likely to go for help, and so that could be part of that statistic, but not all of it. Irritable bowel syndrome, twice as many women. And autoimmune disease, 75% of women, and 90% of people with lupus are women. And yet, the trials are done mostly on men. In 1973, I was quoting some of the studies, like in my book in the, in the 90s, one of my first women's book, and the very first clinical trial, one of the first clinical trials on hormone replacement therapy done in 1973 was done on men. <laughs> so what does this mean for you? So I would get you to ask yourself, what is your goal? What's your goal in healthcare? I would say maybe have it be something like the best level of health with the least degree of harm. And don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. A wonderful, wonderful doctor who I just adore, many, many of you that have been around a while might remember Dr. Carolyn DeMarco. She was a medical doctor, and way back in the day, she and I would do talks kind of on the, not together, but on the same stage, and, and um, we had a lot of respect for each other. And she actually contributed um, in the book something called The Women's Bill of Rights. And she's a very strong advocate for women's health, so I would encourage you to look at that. But really what she says is you have a right to know. Don't be afraid to ask the questions. When I was in practice here in Calgary, I would say, you know, my patients would come and, and you know, they would say, well, since you gave me this, I'm getting better. And I say, well, did you tell your doctor that you're seeing a naturopath? Oh, no, my doctor wouldn't like it if I'm seeing a naturopath. Well, sorry, that's too bad. You know, if you can help yourself and help your health with diet and lifestyle and supplements or products that aren't going to harm you but could help you, then I don't see anything wrong with that or who would take, you know, offense to that. So don't be afraid to speak up. And should disease occur, because no one area of medicine has all the answers, sometimes I'm the first to say, I'm sorry, you need to go to your physician, you need to have surgery, you know, and then come back and we'll help you address what caused this in the first place. Because that's where we want to get to, is treat the cause if, if possible. And so should disease, should disease occur, you have a greater level of knowledge to help you ask those questions and participate in making safe and effective choices for your individual needs and what works for you. Okay? Um, so some of the trends that we're seeing today. So what I'm going to be doing is going through some different conditions. And, um, you know, there's enough people here that I'll probably try to cover everything. Um, sometimes if it's just a small group, I'll say, anybody interested in this? Or, you know, and focus more on certain topics. Um, so stress, I don't think anybody here could relate to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> stress is on the rise. Medical research suggests that 90% of all illness and disease is stress-related. That's a lot. Women are twice as likely to suffer from stress as men. And in some, one of the recent polls I was reading, 36% of Canadians felt so stressed that it affected their daily lives. And the other part that I find disconcerting is teenagers' <coughs> stress rivals that of adults. We think just because we're all grown up and we have all the responsibilities today that we carry the biggest stress. Uh -uh. Teens are dubbed the most anxious generation, and they are the highest stress. Mm -hmm. And why? Is it diet? Is it lifestyle? Is it social media? Is it all the pressures? Is it the electromagnetics? You know, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and lack of communication. 
you know, like they sit there and they don't talk to each other or learn to express their feelings. And, you know, so I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But I look at these things and I go, oh, if that's starting in teens, what are we going to be seeing, you know, when they're in their 30s and 40s? You know, the level of anxiety and depression and cardiovascular disease. Um, so mental health disorders, digestive problems, heart disease, weight gain, memory and cognitive impairment, all of these things have stress as an underlying factor. So how does stress affect the body? Okay, so we've got stressors. We can all recognize mental emotional stress, right? Or financial stress. Um, those we all recognize, but there's a lot of things we don't recognize, like invisible stressors. You know, you go and click your car out there in the parking lot. Well, do you think that happens by magic? No. There's all these frequencies floating around in our environment. You know, these electromagnetic frequencies affect our nervous system. The pesticides, the chemicals in our, in our food, in our water. And I mean, I don't mean this to be doomsday. It's just a matter of being aware of this and that a lot of these unseen stressors are having effects on our stress response in the body. And there's a lot of things we can do to minimize the effect of various stressors in our life. Um, for years, stress has always been a, adrenal health has always been a passion of mine. I call myself queen of adrenals, you know. Um, I was introduced to my adrenal glands and then I, I was, had three kids under the age of three, I was a single parent, my marriage had just broken up, and I taught behavior problem teenagers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I went from being an ever-ready battery that kind of never stopped to ne not being able to get out of bed in the morning. And I was living in a northern town in British Columbia, and so I went to the doctors there, and they said, oh, you're depressed. I thought, I'm not depressed, I don't have time to be depressed, nor the inclination, frankly. And um, so I really didn't know what to do, because I knew I wasn't depressed, and I didn't know what a naturopath was. I mean, you know, friends had said, oh, you should go see this naturopath. So I thought, okay, well, okay. And he introduced me to my adrenal glands. And I've never looked back. He put me on adrenal support, and within fairly short order, I was back running and probably haven't stopped since, so I still take adrenal support. But it's really, really important. I think I would have been one of these people with chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, probably not getting out of bed if, if I hadn't been assessed um, at that point. Um, so when I started practice in the 80s, nobody was really talking about adrenal health. We weren't really trained in it at naturopathic school either. But because of my own experience, I started recognizing it in my patients. So I would always talk about adrenal health when it came to stress, but I never talked about the gut. And how many of you heard of, have heard of the, the gut-brain connection now? The gut being AKA the second brain. Yeah, and it's a, basically a two-way communication system. Stress alters the good and bad microbes, the microbiome in your, in your gut, and causes what we call leaky gut or inflammation and that can lead to different mental health disorders and, and also, you know, physical problems. But if the gut microbiome is altered, whether it's too much sugar in your diet or antibiotics, that directly affects the area of the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, that tell the adrenal glands to put out the stress hormones. So your gut is a two-way communication with the stress response, and your brain is between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Stress initially registers in the brain, and then it tells your adrenal glands to put out stress hormones. And the long-term stress hormone is cortisol. You've all heard of the fight or flight, that's epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, or adrenaline, noradrenaline, you may know it by those terms. And, but within 24 hours of any acute stressor, those hormones usually go back to normal and then the cortisol kind of comes into play over long-term stress. And so if this goes on for too long, the adrenals become tired. How many of you have heard of adrenal fatigue today? Most people, I'm sure. But these little glands, they're about the size of a walnut, and they sit right up on top of your kidneys. And they are really, really, really important to maintain overall health and prevent 
most chronic disease. Um, so the adrenal glands and the gut. Um, the microbiome, inflammation and disease. Again, I talked about alterations in the gut microbiome, but that also leading to um, stress reactions, but that also leads to immune dysregulation. Okay, so always, if your immune system is compromised, always think of the gut as well as supporting your adrenal glands, because the immune system doesn't start to weaken by itself. It's usually longer term stress. Okay, um, so inflammation is one of the major causes. Um, of imbalances, or another term for imbalances in the gut microbiome is called dysbiosis. And dysbiosis can also cause inflammation. So it's kind of a double-edged sword here. So all, Alzheimer's disease, anxiety, depression, inflammatory bowel disease, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, diabetes, and obesity are all associated with gut imbalances. So you can also, when I say gut imbalances, you also think stress, you also think inflammation, okay? Um, because the other factor is, I talked about cortisol as a stress hormone. Initially, cortisol is your friend when it comes to inflammation, okay? But long-term cortisol secretion makes the cells less responsive to the anti-inflammatory effects of cortisol. So what happens is the cells just don't respond anymore to cortisol's anti-inflammatory response and inflammation gets out of control. So stress and inflammation, stress and gut inflammation. So what are some of the things that can cause imbalances in the gut? Because if you remember the gut is part of the stress response, the adrenals are part of the stress response, you're gonna be hearing that over and over, inflammation. So some of the imbalances, over medicating obviously antibiotics, uh, people that take birth control pill or other hormones cause an imbalance in the microbiome, um, antidepressants and acids. Um, chronic stress causes inflammation which causes gut permeability which alters digestive secretion, okay? So people with digestive problems, it's usually inflammation in the gut, environmental factors, and inadequate bacterial acquisition at birth. You know, and now the research is actually starting to look at the importance of um, the microbiome of the mother um, when she's pregnant and the baby and when the baby is born. So gut health of the mother during pregnancy, and basically in our, in our environment, in our North American world today, lack of pre and probiotics. You know, prebiotics being fibers and probiotics being, you know, either your supplemental form or fermented foods. You know, how many people eat sauerkraut? How many people, you know, eat kimchi? How many people use kefir? You know, I mean, obviously, we can get these fermented foods through our diet, that's, beneficial. What is easiest is to take a probiotic. You know, how many people here take probiotics? Because if you're not, you should be. Okay? And you'll see why a little bit more as I go on. So I've already mentioned inflammation and the effect of cortisol. And the prolonged stress alters the ability of cortisol to regulate the inflammatory process. And the gut microbiome leads to dysregulation um, in the microbiome and also not only systemic inflammation, but local inflammation. So obviously any imbalances in the gut could co contribute local inflammation like irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease, but it also causes um, systemic inflammation, which would lead to cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, um, arthritis. Can, can I have your way? No, can you I'm, see? I'm okay. I'm just just Tell me not to move around. <laughs> Autoimmune disease meant, and many um, different mental health conditions um, and diabetes. So inflammation is huge. And Western medicine is starting to recognize the importance of, of controlling inflammation in the body. But then we need to back that up. What causes inflammation? Anybody? Stress, right, exactly, stress. 
and imbalances in the gut. Okay? So what can you do to help these little stress organs? Obviously probiotics. Um, there's different, when I started practice, there were very few things on the market to support the adrenals. Um, Adrenosense has been on the market for a very long time. I don't know, 15, 16 years maybe. Um, and I formulated that product, I think when I was in Calgary, because I wanted my patients to be able to go to a health food store, to be able to send them to a health food store with confidence to say, you know, you can pick up this at the health food store and it'll help to regulate. It doesn't overstimulate the adrenals and it doesn't sedate the adrenals. Some botanicals, some adrenal products might be a little more stimulating and that's fine for people that aren't over rift because how many of you can relate to that sort of go, go, go crash? You know, go, go, go crash. Okay, that can happen for years with the adrenals where the adrenals get overstimulated and you're just go, go, go and then all of a sudden you crash. You're exhausted. And that cycle can go on and off for many, many years. And if you're in that go, go, go period where your adrenals are a little hyper or over revved and you take something too stimulating, you're going to be even more stimulated. Okay? So the adrenosense just helps to regulate. Siberian ginseng isn't really a ginseng. It's called, it's an eleutherocyte, so it's not a stimulating um, herb like Panax ginseng might be a little more stimulating for some people. So Adrenosense, I've been taking that since forever. You know, not all the time, but when I have more demands, you know, in my life, which is pretty much all the time these days. <laughs> um, but the Adrenosense contains adaptogens, you know, um, and they just help the body maintain balance. Um, brain defense. Um, it's a wonderful anti-inflammatory. It also contains ashwagandha, and it also contains bacopa, which help the body adapt to stress. So if you're looking for something that has some stress balancing effect and anti-inflammatories like boswellia and curcumin, and everybody you know, thinks of chamomile as more of a relaxing, calming herb, it's a wonderful anti-inflammatory, especially for gastrointestinal disorders, yeah. So, you know, so the brain defense has chamomile in it, boswellia, <coughs> curcumin, bacopa, and ashwagandha. So it can help the stress aspect of inflammation and directly affect the inflammation. It's kind of one of my, my go-tos. And probiotics, obviously, are very, very important. And I don't think I've ever treated a case in the 25 years I was in practice of anxiety that didn't have underlying adrenal dysregulation. Um, Women are approximately 75% more likely than men to report having suffered from depression. And general anxiety disorders affect about twice as many women as men. And again, I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, kind of a spike in anxiety in general, a spike in our stress, um, stress effects that people are feeling in, in Canada, but I think it's pretty global. Um, and 41% of Canadians are at high risk for mental I, I was just diagnosed with depression. And I'd ask them some questions and I'd talk to them a bit more. And really what it came down to is they were just too tired to care. It's like, go tell somebody who cares. Because I just don't have the energy. You know? And so that, if I assessed and I looked at their adrenal function and, and found that they were low adrenal, I would check their thyroid. Um, and often if I got their adrenals functioning properly and got their gut functioning properly and made sure their thyroid was okay, they didn't have depression once their energy started coming back. Um, so other factors, obviously microbial imbalance, inflammation, and I'll get to that in a minute, the inflammation side of anxiety and depression. Sugar, sugar is a mood altering drug. It's that simple. Yeah. You know, so, you know, people tend to eat way too much sugar and refined carbohydrates. Uh, vitamin D, low levels have been associated with clinically significant symptoms of depression in otherwise healthy individuals. And of course, food allergies are huge to help, you know, with people with moods and, and um, um, anxiety. So the inflammation factor in anxiety and depression 
Um, a study examined data from 14,000 people, and researchers found that those who had depression had, the, had a 46% higher level of C-reactive protein. What is C-reactive protein? It's a marker of inflammation in the body. And those with the most severe forms of depression had the highest amount of C-reactive protein or the most inflammation in the body. Now here's a really interesting um, study. People are considered treatment resistant when they have been given two rounds of antidepressants and didn't respond. Okay, so they're considered treatment resistant. Well, what they did with this group of people is they gave them an anti-inflammatory. They gave them aspirin. By the end of the trial, 80% of the people improved. So they hadn't responded to the antidepressants, but as soon as you added the anti-inflammatory, they responded. So was it the anti-inflammatory or was it the antidepressant that helped them? And evidence suggests that increased inflammation, inflammatory activity in patients with panic disorder, disorders and generalized anxiety disorder as well. So again, inflammation and anxiety, inflammation and depression, what causes inflammation? Gut imbalances, adrenal stress, okay? Um, elevated C-reactive protein levels were found in those with an older, those of older age um, that had an anxiety disorder, particularly those over 50, had higher levels of inflammation in the body and higher um, levels of anxiety. So, you know, if you want, if you go to your doctor and they're doing, especially as, as you age, uh, one of the main things they may check in your blood work is C-reactive protein because what they're checking for there is usually cardiovascular risk factors. It's a more important measurement than any cholesterol measurements ever will be because if there's inflammation in your arteries, then that's when cholesterol is deposited as a protective mechanism. And it's protected, it's laid down to protect from the infl inflammatory response in your blood vessels. Cholesterol in and of itself is not the culprit. So support for anxiety and depression. Well, obviously I think the foundation would be adrenal support and probiotics, you know? Like, just make sure that your, your stress reactions are as optimal as they can be. And there's different things out there. St. John's Ward is very helpful for a lot of people. There is a relatively new product on the market called Cloud9. And 5-HTP is well known to help with, with depression. Vitamin B6, inositol. But saffron is kind of the new entry, to, you know, the new kid on the block, if you will, for depression. And saffron has been shown to be as effective as many antidepressants, particularly the tricyclic antidepressants. Now, having said that, um, if people are, all, are already taking an antidepressant, particularly an SSRI, which is very, you know, most antidepressants today are SSRIs, um, saffron, or anything with saffron in it, or anything with St. John's wort in it, would be contraindicated. Okay, but if you're feeling like you know you're feeling you know like you might be a little bit depressed, or you have some mood imbalances, and you're not on an antidepressant, and you want to help your overall mental emotional state, an ant an ant a natural anti-inflammatory like Brain Defense and Cloud Nine could be helpful. But again, I'm going to say treat the gut and treat the adrenals first, and then see how you feel, and have your thyroid checked. And I'll be getting to that in a minute. So stress and anxiety, anxiety, L-theanine, you know, is really good. It's found in green tea. Um, <coughs> there's different products, <coughs> mental calmness, PharmaGaba. Does anybody here take GABA? Yeah, it's really great if, you, if you're feeling a bit anxious, particularly for the people that have that sort of over-revved adrenal thing, and then what happens is you sort of push yourself through the day, and then, and then at night you've been pushing all day, and then a lot of people end up with insomnia. So what happens, the GABA is able to kind of be the break and sort of help that over-secretion of stress hormones during the day 
so that you don't get into that completely over rev state at night. Okay, so GABA can be very helpful in addition to adrenal support because people that have been had low adrenal for a long time, it doesn't heal overnight. You know, it takes a long time. And if you're still under a lot of stress, you're going to be using probably a lot of the reserve that you're building up by supporting your adrenals. So GABA can be very helpful to kind of put the brake on a little bit. And then if you do, or CAVA, CAVA is also really good for anxiety. Um, anybody experience insomnia? Yeah, quite a few people. Yeah, 45% of the world's population. And again, usually it's, you know, too much stress, too much stress on the nervous system. Um, so adrenal, find an adrenal support that doesn't overstimulate you. Look at, you know, your gut. One in seven Canadians, 15 years or older, have trouble going to or staying asleep. And most um, evidence suggests a female predisposition for insomnia and definitely hormone changes. I know for me, I could sleep anywhere, anytime. And then around my late 40s, early 50s, as I was starting to enter the menopausal window, um, I stopped sleeping. And I refused to take medication. The natural remedies were not working for me. Because what happened is I would push myself all day. All day, it was like my adrenals were like this tired old workhorse, so I take out the whip and just whip it all day, right? So finally, by the end of the day, I'm kind of up and running, and I get home, and I'm absolutely exhausted, but I'm absolutely wired. I can't shut down. And I did that for months after month after month, and I would just sit on the floor at night and rock and cry until about 5 in the morning, and then I'd fall asleep, but my alarm would go off at 7. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so then I'd have to go to work and do it all again. Till finally, I thought, you know what? I can't survive like this. So I took a prescription medication, and it helped, you know, um, lower that sort of over secretion of cortisol to some degree. And then the natural remedies did work, because what happens is stress causes insomnia. Okay, but insomnia is a stressor. So it becomes this vicious cycle. So you need to get off of that wheel, however you do it. And then once the adrenals are more regulated, then I found that the natural remedies work really well. So there's different causes of insomnia. I've already talked about stress, anxiety, thyroid, depression can be a factor in insomnia. Medical conditions, restless leg syndrome. Anyone experience? Oh. Yes. B12. B12 and or make sure you have your ferritin checked for iron. Um, and gut probiotics. Uh, restless leg syndrome is a big contributor to, for many women with insomnia. Um, hormone imbalance, cardiovascular conditions, GI disorders. And stimulants you know, later in the afternoon, whether it's sugar or coffee, because you just think, oh, I just can't get through the afternoon, right? Um, and sometimes even exercise later in the day. If you're, if you're in that sort of hyperadrenal state, exercise will stimulate the adrenals even more, temporarily. So try to keep your afternoon and evenings, you know, free of stimulants as much as possible. Um, so stress hormones and insomnia, I think I've already covered that. Um, as far as the, the vicious cycle of getting off the wheel. But stress and insomnia. Research shows that one night of sleep, one night of sleep restricted to four hours, caused cortisol levels to be 37% higher the next day. So what happens if you're not sleeping night after night after night. Not only are you, for me, it was debilitating. You know, I think unless people have been through a bad cycle of insomnia, they have no idea how debilitating it is. Because you look okay. People think you're fine. They think it's all in your head, right? It's not, believe me. And, but if, you, if the cortisol levels are going up that much more because of insomnia as a stressor, and remember what I said about cortisol leading to most chronic disease, 
So it's really, really, really important to um, somehow find something that works for your sleep. And also, high cortisol at night stops the production of melatonin. So, you know, and that also melatonin obviously is necessary for our sleep. So my go-to's over the years, the things that did work for me once I was able to sort of down-regulate the adrenals a bit, get off of that hyper-adrenal state, um, was Skullcap was a big favorite of mine, and Passionflower. But I never really found a product that had enough of each in it as a, as a multi sort of ingredient formula. And restful sleep is amazing. I think it's getting some really, really good feedback. It's a relatively new product on the market for sleep. It has passion flowers, skull cap, California poppies. So for some people it can help if they have pain and that's some of the reason they're not sleeping. And linden flowers have been used in Europe for years to help people with sleep. So, and it's also very, very good for anxiety. All of the herbs in this product um, are also anti-anxiety with the exception of maybe California poppy. But anxiety is often an underlying cause of insomnia. In fact, very commonly, knowingly or unknowingly. You know, sometimes it just happens and you can't put a finger on why, right? But other times you can recognize that your mind's just a bit busy, you've got too much on your plate, um, which is common today. And Restful sleep was pur purposely formulated without melatonin in it because some people don't react well to melatonin. Some people respond really well and it works really well for them. You know, I know if I'm in a good cycle, melatonin works well, but some of the times it doesn't do anything. Um, and 5-HTP is also very common. Sometimes that works for people. So tranquil sleep, it has 5-HTP it has and melatonin in it. Um, and valerian works for some people, but some people it gives them a hangover. You know, it makes them feel really groggy the next morning. Um, so find whatever works for you for sleep. You know, and if you've tried everything and the natural remedies haven't worked, try restful sleep. You know, and if you have to take, you know, four before, an hour before bed, then, then try it. Um, Is so, it safe to take long term, tranquil sleep? Tranquil sleep, yes. And I think what you'll find too is once you know the adrenals are more regulated and your nervous system is is um, yeah that you'll need less okay. and you'll probably I know for myself you know I need it if I'm in overly busy cycles just because of my nature and my whole you know queen of adrenal thing <laughs> um, but yeah you know I don't need to take something every night um, but yes it is safe to take. Um, how many of you heard of um, xenoestrogens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of you. Okay. Um, that's a term I'm going to encourage you to become familiar with. Xenoestrogens are chemicals that are found in, our, in pesticides, plastics, most cosmetics that we're slathering on our body every day. Um, and what these chemicals do is they resemble the natural estrogen that our body makes. When I wrote my first book in 1998-99 um, on women's health, I wrote in the book called, something called No More Baby Alligators, and I, it's again in my new book. But what I found is there was researchers in the Florida Everglades, and what they were finding is that baby alligators were being born and they couldn't tell what sex they were. They were hermaphroditic. And they couldn't figure out why, what was affecting the, the, the hormone balance in these, in these alligators. So they went upstream and they found there was a plastics plant dumping all their stuff into the river that went into the Everglades. And then they started looking at some of the other animals and the panthers, they were finding the female panthers had ovaries like that were this big. And then they decided to see just how quickly it affected um, fish. So they put fish in a cage right where the toxic chemicals were coming out of the, the factory into the river. And within about three or four days, the male fish were becoming feminized. Um, so this 
What happens with our, the, the, the xenoestrogens is they cause something called estrogen dominance. And some of the most common conditions caused by these es xenoestrogens or estrogen imposters are endometriosis, fibroids, PMS, often infertility, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, weight gain, migraines, thyroid disorders, and obviously breast cancer. What they found is the combined estrogenic activity of mixes of xenoestrogens was positively associated with breast cancer risk. Even though one, no one single compound had a significant effect. So do you hear what I'm saying? One single chemical. So they'll say, oh, that chemical, that, that's not going to cause breast cancer, or that's not going to cause cancer. But we're swimming in this, this mix. So it was the combined estrogenic activity of many different xenoestrogenic substances that led to a higher increase in risk for breast cancer. Again, it's that total body load principle. It's never just one thing. It's accumulated, even for stress. You know, you can be stressed at work, you, you know, but it's never just one thing. It's that culmination of all the different stressful events. It's the culmination of all the different chemicals in our environment, that, and in this case, the ones that have xenoestrogenic activity. Um, interesting, there are di many different um, body care products in your health food stores that use safe um, ingredients. Most of the ones that you buy commercially do not, and the same with your cleaning products. And I think that's why women are more at risk. I'm not saying men don't use lotions and don't use body care products, but women do so more. And women are more apt, and I don't mean to be stereotypic, but they are more the ones that are probably doing the cleaning and using the chemical products at home. So do what you can. None of us can live in a bubble. <laughs> you know, but when you become aware of these different things in our environment, the different products, the different chemicals that can affect our health in a negative way, you can try to minimize that as much as possible. So there's a new um, body care line out. Called, it's called Women's Sense Clean Body Care Products, and it's zero xenos, basically. And there was a study that I found absolutely astounding. They took teens, and they put the teens for two weeks um, on only safe care body products only safe, clean body products. And they had done a blood chemistry prior as a baseline, and then they did another test, I think it was after, yeah, after three days. And then they were gonna test again at the end of the trial. And after three days, the chemicals in their body had significantly reduced. That was just by eliminating the daily use of these chemicals on our skin. So choose clean, lotions, clean, cleaning products, anything that you're putting on and in your body. We can take responsibility for our environment, but we can take more direct responsibility for what we choose to put into our body and on our body. So the importance of the liver. So the liver is responsible for pretty much the deactivation and elimination and excretion of toxic chemicals. It's your kind of first line uh, defense when it comes to getting rid of chemicals in the body. And it can get really overloaded too with all the you know, toxic stressors in our life. Um, and also, it affects hormone health as well because 50% of the metabolism, estrogen, takes place in the liver. We were never taught in medical school that hormone balance had, had anything to do with either the, the ovaries, ovaries producing hormones or the, you know, testes producing testosterone. You know, but the liver and the gut and the adrenals, which I'll get to in a minute, have a profound effect on hormone balance for men and women. The gut, even if your liver is able to excrete these hormones, they have to go through the gut. And if your gut microbiome is out of balance, these couples break up, like they've formed in couples, they're conjugated in the liver, and they go through the digestive and out through the, the large intestine. Well, if your gut microbiome is out of balance, these couples get divorced in your intestine and go back into circulation. So your gut health is really important for hormone balance. Your liver health is really important for hormone balance. 
Um, and there's lots of things you can do, both with diet and your, your daily um, routine, to help the liver, and that also helps the elimination of toxic chemicals. Um, so start your day with a, a cup of warm water and lemon. The liver really likes that in the morning. Move your body, you know, moving really helps the blood flow in the liver. Avoid harmful chemicals and choose organic when you can. Detox superfoods. The cruciferous vegetables are really, really important for helping not only metabolize, but to also excrete these harmful estrogens from the body. Um, so kale, cabbage, turmeric, beets, and some of the newer studies on beets are showing that they're, real, they're very, very effective for hypertension as well. So beet juice, steamed beets. Beet is high in sugar, is it okay to? Yeah, you're not gonna eat too many beets, right? Yeah, like carrots are high in sugar, potatoes are high in sugar, beets are high in sugar, you know. Even daily, do you have the brushes? Beets, yeah, I would alternate between say lemon and water and, and beets, sure. Um, and then, and then for those women um, that have estrogen dominant conditions or imbalances in their hormones, um, Estrosense is a really great product that I would put most of my patients on either for one week a month just to make sure that the liver is happy and to help with the excretion of some of these chemicals or if they had estrogen dominant conditions like PMS or endometriosis or fibroids, then estrosense is something that I would recommend regularly. And milk thistle is probably one of the most important ingredients in there because it helps the pathway in the liver that helps the breakdown of these toxic chemicals. It also contains indo-3 carbonyl and calcium deglutarate, which help the met metabolism and excretion of these toxic chemicals. So for women that have um, hormone imbalances, that's definitely something to consider. Thyroid. Anybody interested in thyroid? Yeah, that's a lecture in and of itself, I think. Um, a sec here. So one in 10 Canadians has a thyroid disorder, and of those, up to 50% are undiagnosed and 25% of women, 10% of men. The thyroid hormone is like the gas pedal for your body to help with metabolism and energy. And what happens over time, and particularly if um, a man or a woman, but I'm, I'm speaking women's health tonight, um, if a woman has had low adrenal function for years and hasn't addressed it, then it's very, very common as you hit the sort of perimenopause, menopause window, that the thyroid will become more affected, shall we say, because the thyroid and the adrenal, even though they have different functions, they kind of help each other out. And so if the adrenal's been struggling for a long time, the thyroid has also been overworking. And so at menopause, it was so common for me to see people come in that were on hormone replacement therapy and thyroid medication. And I'll talk to that a little bit more in a minute. But it's really important to start now. Like I remember when my first book came out, a patient walked into my office and she saw my book and she was in her 20s, somewhere in there. And she said, when? oh, that's not me, you know, because it was called menopause, you know, um, a naturopathic approach. And, um, and she said, oh, that's not me. When should I start thinking about this? I said, really? At birth. You know, I was being a little bit facetious, but the more we're aware of the things that contribute to hormonal health, the easier time we'll have with every hormonal transition, whether it's puberty or whether it's menopause. And so, you know, adrenals, and in my book I get into a whole adrenal stress, you know, questionnaire and give common symptoms of adrenal fatigue, so you can really look at that and just see if you can, you know, if you identify with the symptoms of stress and low adrenal. So, hypo, so thyroid is really, really important. And today, um, the number, the assessment that's normally done for thyroid is only a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. That comes from your pituitary. Your pituitary tells the thyroid to stimulate to produce and secrete thyroid hormone, 
T4 and T3. So it's kind of counterintuitive. The more stimulus required, so the more TSH, the higher the TSH, the lower the thyroid, okay? So the parameters, the reference range, are, it, and it varies, it changes depending on which lab you go to, but it's approximately 0.45 to 4.5. Now that's a really wide range because even one point can make a huge difference in how people feel. So that's normal range, okay? There's a big difference between normal and optimal. So if you go for your thyroid test and your doctor says, oh, your thyroid test is normal, ask what your number is. Because if the, I, the optimal range is between one and 1.5, maybe two. But so many people come into the sort of three, under three range, but they're starting to have symptoms of low thyroid, which, you know, is up, you know, so weight gain, cold intolerance, dry skin, hair loss, fatigue, cognitive problems, constipation, depression, and infertility is very, infertility is very common in women that have undiagnosed thyroid problem. Um, so ask what your number is or see a naturopath because they run a full thyroid panel. You know, I would never just test TSH. Your TSH can be completely normal, but your T4 and, T and T3 might be abnormal because T3 is the active form of thyroid hormone. And you have to convert T4 to T3. And most of the medication given today for thyroid disorders is T4 only, okay? but they're not testing antibodies, you know? Um, if your TSH is fine, you're fine. And Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is inflammation of the thyroid, is the most common form of hypothyroidism today. And yet they're not testing for antibodies, especially in preclinical, and I would have to call anything in the normal range preclinical, because you're not falling off the cliff yet. Because that's the problem with these reference ranges today. You have to wait until you're actually fallen off the cliff, until you're out of the normal range to be treated. You don't want that. You want to, to deal with things before you get to the edge of the cliff and fall off and come back towards a more you know, normal level. Um, so make sure that you know what your numbers are. I'll take questions at the end, if you don't mind. Um, um, so if you're um, in that preclinical range um, and you've already been supporting your adrenals, now I'm going to say it, always support your adrenals first, okay? And then if a lot of the symptoms that look like hypothyroid has, haven't improved and your, your doctor says your thyroid is still normal but you still have symptoms of hypothyroidism, then you can consider adding some natural support for hypothyroidism. Thyrosense is a really good um, natural product. It contains tyrosine, which helps the conversion of T4 to T3. Ashwagandha, which is also in the adrenal sense, can help support the adrenals and the thyroid. Um, iodine, of course. Um, Google, manganese, copper, B5, all of these things are cofactors that help support the thyroid. Um, but always, always, always treat the adrenals first. If you're taking a thyroid medication and you're still feeling that you're not getting, you're not feeling any better, you can add thyrosense if you're taking, but I would probably suggest that you add adrenal support first because the adrenal sense at least has ashwagandha in it. So if you're taking a thyroid med and you haven't been doing anything for your adrenals, support your adrenals first and then see how you feel. And if you can, because once you've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, your doctor should be checking T4 and T3 with every test. And if they're not, you can request it. I don't know how it is in Alberta, but in BC, um, they w the labs will not run a T4 and T3 unless you have been previously diagnosed with hypothyroidism. 
Now it's a bit of an oxymoron, I think, because it's impossible to get a, a, a good diagnosis of hypothyroidism unless you've had a full thyroid panel in the first place. So if you're not seeing a naturopath or a complementary medical doctor, you can say to your doctor, I know it can't be covered under my Alberta health care, but would you please give me a separate requisition for T4, T3 and antibodies and I will pay for it. It's only about $40 <coughs> and it's well worth it. Especially if you can relate to some of the symptoms of low thyroid or especially if you're entering into the menopause window. Um, because thyroid and adrenal are really, really critical at any stage, but they become even more so um, at the time of menopause. So the production, stress and hormones. Cholesterol is the raw material that makes all hormones. It's not the bad guy. And cholesterol breaks down into different pathways. And this is a more simplified version. But the precursor hormones, pregnenolone, DHEA, andro androstenedione, that pathway is a normal pathway to make the steroid hormones, estrogen and testosterone, okay? But if you're chronically stressed, a lot of those, the raw material is going to be shunted to the cortisol pathway. So you're going to be robbed. It's kind of like a pregnenolone, progesterone steel that robs you from the raw material to help make the estrogens and progesterone and testosterone in your body, okay? So again, stress directly affects hormone production. So menopause. Well, it is a bit of a pesky thing. <laughs> you know, some of the symptoms are rather irritating for those women that have been through it, no. And um, for those that are entering it, you'll soon find out. Um, but the adrenal glands become the primary source of hormone production when your ovaries start taking a very well-deserved vacation. The ovaries never really completely stop. They just really, really, really slow down in their production, unless you've had surgery, obviously. Um, so some women suffer terribly because they've had long-term adrenal you know, fatigue when they enter menopause. So, and then the other thing, many of the symptoms of menopause are very similar to hypothyroidism. So is it menopause or is it thyroid? Because commonly, if you're menopausal age, you go into your doctor and you say, you know, I'm gaining weight and, you know, my skin's dry and I have brain fog and I'm tired. They'll say, oh, you're menopausal, have some hormones. <laughs> you know, but they don't check your thyroid. So insist on a thyroid test. You know, TSH is better than nothing. Just remember the optimal range. So what are some of the symptoms of menopause? Well, I think you're most, probably mostly familiar. Hot flashes are the main ones, sweating, vaginal dryness, irregular periods. Insomnia is huge for many, many, many women. And I would say particularly women that have had low adrenal function for many years. Um, brain fog. The brain fog usually will lift, though, once you're kind of through those first few years of menopause. Um, low libido, bladder incontinence. But despite the list of symptoms, it, menopause is not a disease that requires decades of drug therapy. It's a natural transition that we're all going to go through. And I'm sorry, ladies, there's no avoiding it. You know, um, you know it's a little irritating at times. I mean, I'm in my 70s, and I still get hot flashes. Yeah. I mean, most recently I thought, my gosh, what's going on? I'm not 50 anymore, because, I mean, it was just really bad this week. And I'm like, stop it already. <laughs> I'm supposed to be finished this, right? But no, I mean, I just think it just kind of lets you know that your ovaries are still alive and well, you know, and there's still things happening there. And for women that... Um, have debility, you know, I'm not against hormone replacement therapy. You know, I'm going to suggest that whenever possible, work with the natural remedies, always support the adrenals, 
Um, there's different natural products out there. Black cohosh has been extensively studied for women in menopause um, and has been very effective for hot flashes and vaginal dryness. Um, Vitex is really good. Um, Metasense has orizinol and hesperidin, which help with hot flashes. But that might not work. If you're really, like if you're in meetings and every five minutes you're hot flashing and you're soaking wet, hormone replacement therapy, my, I would always say to my patients, okay, you know, we're gonna support your adrenals, make sure your thyroid's functioning. I'm still gonna recommend some natural things to help with the hot flashes and everything. But, you know, if that's not helping, I'll recommend some natural progesterone therapy. I, I was usually a, a proponent of bioidentical hormones. Um, but the minimal dose, so I wouldn't necessarily put them on the regular dose every day. It would be like, okay, you know, if you're okay at three days a week on hormone replacement, then take it three days. Don't take any more than what you need, right? And the general rule of thumb today is the minimal dose for the least amount of time. And when all that scare came out on hormone replacement many years ago, I'd be speaking to groups of women, like some women were in their 70s and 80s, and they'd be saying, well, I just quit my hormones cold turkey. And it was just like going through menopause all over again. I thought, well, of course it is, because you don't need the same level of hormones in your body at 70 and 80 as you did in your 40s, you know? So you're gonna pay the piper at some point. So, you know, um, is, and if you are taking hormones and want to go off, wean off gradually and make sure you're supporting your adrenals and thyroid and everything else that I have talked about. And I get into this in a lot more detail um, in the book and how to wean off and what particular hormones are perhaps safer than others. Um, because we're just kind of doing a snapshot tonight of different conditions that, you know, women may experience. So, and we, you know, typically we talk about menopause and we talk about some of the hormone imbalances in younger women, but what about as we age? You know, what can we do, some of the basic things? Like I found in my 50s, either than the pesky side of menopause, you know, I didn't really have to think about too much, you know, nothing really changed. 60s, yeah, probably the same, but I've noticed in my later 60s and early 70s, you know, maybe I need to sort of be a little bit more aware that I can't do what I did in my 40s as far as, you know, and it's hard to accept, you know, um, but, and maybe my energy isn't what it, what it once was. So there's some really basic things that we can start at any time that can sort of help ease into sort of these um, older years and do it with as much health and grace as possible. And sometimes I have a hard time with the grace part because, you know, it's frustrating not to be able to do what I used to do. You know, you feel the same in here as you did in your 20s and 30s and 40s, but your body doesn't cooperate the way it used to. So exercise is really important for cognition as we age. It keeps the muscles strong. It's usually with aging women, it's not the break in osteoporosis that causes the fall. It's the fall that causes the break. So the stronger you keep your muscles, the less risk you have of fracture. Um, keep the mind active. Read something, do something new, challenge your brain, drive a different route to work. You know, just do something different. Um, Vitamin D deficiency is associated with muscle weakness and 50% of aging women are deficient. A couple years ago, I had my vitamin D levels checked and just for more or less curiosity, I didn't think for a minute that I'd be deficient because I don't run from the sun. I'm not, I don't wear sunscreen. I mean, I'm not silly about it. I don't go out after a long winter and you know, sit in the sun. Um, and I take vitamin D, probably 5,000 I use maybe three days a week or four days a week. And I have my vitamin D level checked and I'm low normal. If I'm low normal, what are most people out there? And what are these little kids today that we're covering in zoot suits and slathering in sunscreen and not allowing the sun to provide vitamin D and yet we're not supplementing them? I'm fine if parents want to protect them, their kids from the sun, but at least supplement your children. 
vitamin D is a hormone. It's, it's now considered a hormone. It's so important in the body. Um, energy levels. That's the one thing that, you know, I think most people as they age might notice is changes, changes in energy levels. So omega-3 fatty acids, again, probiotics, and I've talked enough about adrenal support, but that can help with energy level at any age. And water. Our thirst decreases as we age as well, and at 80, we have 50% less water in the body than we did when we were in our 20s. And as I get into sort of memory loss and dementias, you'll start to understand a little bit more the importance of water for mental health and cognition. Um, and obviously some drugs, you know, and a lot of people are on diuretics um, or laxatives as they age, and that also causes dehydration. Um, so drink at least one and a half to two liters of water a day. And in Alberta, where it is so dry, I would say you probably need even more than that. So, and just remember too, like some people say, oh yeah, but I'm going to be running to the washroom every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes. Well, when you don't drink water, your body thinks it's on a desert and it holds on to water. It's a self-preservation. And along with holding on to the water, in holding on to water in your body, you're also holding on to the toxins. If they're not being flushed out of your body. So at first, you may be going to the washroom more because your body's finally saying, oh, I'm off this desert, thank goodness. I can eliminate, you know, now I can eliminate properly so it'll start excreting some of the fluid. You know, because I've had patients say to me, why when I fly do my legs swell? And I say, do you drink water on the plane? Oh no, because I'd have to get up and go to the washroom all the time. I say, because your body's dehydrated and it's retaining fluid wherever it can. You know, so drinking water is often the way to get rid of excess water in the body. Um, so dementias. This, in Canada, one person every nine minutes will be diagnosed with dementia. And dementia is the umbrella term. There's Alzheimer's disease under the dementia and vascular dementia and a couple other more um, not so common forms of dementias. Alzheimer's disease represents 63% of all dementias and vascular dementia represents 20%. And again, I said earlier, 72% of people with Alzheimer's disease are women. Now that could be because of the ApoE4 gene, you know, that women have, men don't, um, as part of it, but it could also be that women have a higher fat content in the body and hang on to chemicals a little more you know, and lack of antioxidants in the body, so more free radical damage. Um, there's several reasons um, for different causes of memory loss, and not all memory problems are dementia. I know for me, if I miss two or three nights sleep, I don't have a break, you know, but it's temporary. Um, thyroid disorders, and Western me doctors now are becoming more aware uh, especially in the elderly, of untreated hypothyroidism has many of the same symptoms as dementia. People with untreated hypothyroidism appear confused, demented, have memory loss, and are often misdiagnosed. And I think that was the case with my mother. I mean, she had vascular problems and she had that some degree of vascular dementia, but I'm 90% sure she had a thyroid problem that was not diagnosed. Um, so hormone changes, but again, that's temporary. Diabetes, Alzheimer's is dis disease is considered diabetes type three today. So blood sugar metabolism is huge with brain health. Um, hypertension, and I'm gonna get to that in a minute because it's really quite astounding. And of course, pharmaceuticals. Many older people on, are on a mix of polypharmacy that contribute to Alzheimer's disease and statins are one of the most offending factors there. Um, so there are many, many different causes of memory problems. And for any of you that have either nursed a loved one with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, um, you know that you want to do everything you can do to not only prevent it in yourself, 
but to help your loved ones. And the same with any ment mental health condition. People don't change in here. They are the same on the inside. But when it comes to mental health, they become, it becomes more difficult for them to express themselves in the world around them. And for those people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, it becomes impossible. And what I found in, with my mother and patients over the years is we're the ones that have to make the changes because they are incapable of making those changes. But there's a lot of things that can really help them. Um, now, the influence of the heart on the brain. This is really interesting. Uncontrolled high blood pressure, many people have high blood pressure today, damages the brain structure and function in individuals as young as 40. A study published in The Lancet in 2012, people with hypertension showed accelerated brain aging, decreased cognitive function, and increased risk for dementia. Something disappeared there. Um, yeah, half that study disappeared. And what they found is that, now, here's the part that really got to me. Children and adolescents, Children and adolescents, I want you to hear that. Their incidence of hypertension rose 27% in a 13 year period. Kids and adolescents. One in four teens, 12 to 17 today, in Canada are obese or overweight. And I think that's a major contributing factor to hypertension and why we're going to be seeing memory problems and perhaps damaged brain structure in younger and younger people if we don't start changing the direction we're going with our kids and our diet and our, you know, and getting the word out there. You know, it's really, really, really important. We think, oh well, they're just overweight, but look at the risks mental, emotional health, physical health, cardiovascular health, diabetes, the big ones today, right? So, so inflammation and stress in dementias. Again, it all gets back to inflammation and stress, doesn't it? I mean, you're gonna get sick and tired of hearing that, but it's inflammation and stress. A research team found that just one episode, one episode of systemic inflammation could be sufficient to trigger a more rapid decline in neurological function. And researchers found that when animals were injected for just seven days with stress hormones, the amyloid protein, so amyloid plaque, you know, is the signature of Alzheimer's disease, in the brain increased by 60%. Seven days, stress hormones. So, Stress and inflammation are erasing our brain cells. <laughs> so what can we do about it? So before I get into that, well, it's part of what you can do about it. I'm just gonna lighten things up a little bit. Um, when I moved back to the Okanagan, I was living in Vancouver and my mom had been diagnosed with dementia. So I thought it was time just to be back closer to where my mom lived. So I moved back to the Okanagan and so I could see her more often. And I read a study where walking backwards prevented Alzheimer's disease. So I lived out in Aramata, I'm from a farming community, and I thought, wow, if I walk up this hill backwards, I can see the lake, it's beautiful, and I'm preventing Alzheimer's, it's a win-win, right? So I'm walking up this hill backwards, and it's a really steep hill, I'm walking up the hill, and you know, this farmer in the truck you know, comes down the hill in his truck and unrolls his window and he says, hey lady, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm preventing Alzheimer's disease. And he said, I hate to tell you, but you're way too late. <laughs> Seriously, true story. <laughs> so I thought, okay. <laughs> you know, so really, <laughs> um, whatever you can do to sort of, you know, <laughs> um, prevent prevent uh, memory, memory loss. Um, so there's so many... You know, I think it's redoing the patterns. Your muscle memory and, and changing the direction and changing the way you do things. You know? 
Because we get into our habits. We're kind of rote, you know, creatures of habit. Whereas if you challenge your brain and the synapses and the pathways in your brain and do something different, you know, I'm sure that can help keep the synapses, you know, connected a little better. Um, so there's a lot of different things. Obviously, the brain defense, which I've talked about for inflammation, is really, really important. Some of the most recent studies on, on Alzheimer's is that, you know, inflammation is a main cause of Alzheimer's disease and the deposition of plaques and tangles in the, in the brain. Um, <clears throat> there's different um, brain products out there in a new line. Daily Brain has curcumin. It's like a little packet, like it's in a box and it's a little packet of five different in supplements. So instead of taking five different bottles and opening the bottles every day, I was looking at it and I was going, my gosh, it has curcumin, which I'm already taking because I think curcumin is wonderful. Um, grape seed, so an antioxidant, I was taking a different one. Uh, probiotic, omega-3s, and I was taking all of those individually. The only one I wasn't taking was phosphatidylserine which is really specific for cognition and brain health. And I thought, well, I should be taking that because of my mother's history with dementia, right? So I kind of see daily brain for people, you know, younger people or people that haven't yet noticed, you know, any changes in memory or, or the brain that just kind of want to support not only the influence of the gut on the brain, but just antioxidants and omegas and probiotics. Um, so daily brain is what I see as kind of the foundation, kind of like your multivitamin, if you will, for, for the brain. Um, and then brain defense, obviously, I've talked about. And memory boost for people that are a little older that might be noticing changes in their brain. Um, it's a wonderful formula, actually. It's antioxidants and acetylcysteine, um, uh, alpha-lipoic acid, L-carnitine. All those antioxidants actually prevent inflammation, um, can help prevent inflammation, and has ginkgo and vinpocetine, which increase blood flow to the brain. So memory boost is something to consider. You know, I, I'll be looking at that, you know, probably. You know, I, I mean, I have my excuse. I think, God, how, sometimes I walk into the room four times and have to retrace my steps. What did I walk in here for? You know, but I've been doing that since I was 40. So that's my excuse. I don't think that's changed. But it's definitely something, having seen so many people with memory loss and dementias, that I seriously want to prevent for myself. And so stress and inflammation is kind of where, you know, I would start with that. And then water. Water, water, water. You see there a normal brain and a dehydrated brain. A dehydrated, shriveled up brain doesn't work very well. <laughs> a healthy brain and a diseased brain. You can see that the dehydrated brain looks very similar. I used to say, if I could hook up the old Older people, I was going to say old folks, but that's me now, <laughs> in my mom's home to IV water, that probably 40% of their symptomatology, whether it's mental or physical, would improve. Because they don't drink water, they drink coffee, they drink juice, they drink things that dehydrate them. So water, water, water. So different lifestyle choices. Water is essential for optimal brain function, prevents dehydration, increases blood circulation. Like if you're dehydrated, your blood gets really sticky. Let's say sludgy, okay? Well, what is the heart? I mean, it's much more than a pump. We know that today. But it kind of works like a pump. It pumps the blood through all the pipes in your body, the arteries and the veins, right? Well, if it's sludgy and sticky, substances that it's having to pump, what happens? The pressure has to build up in that pump, right? So the pressure goes up. So sometimes, not always, but sometimes just addressing the stress and drinking more water helps so many people with hypertension. Because you don't have sludgy, sticky blood anymore. So there's less stress on the heart. You know, the stress hormones that influence um, Hypertension is huge. Remember what I said about hypertension and damage to brain structures? So water, water, water. Even mild levels of dehydration affect mental performance. 
The Mediterranean diet, how many people are familiar with the Mediterranean diet? Yeah, it's really, really, if we would adhere more to the Mediterranean diet, lots of oils, lots of good oils and fats in our diet, um, you know, fish, you know, sure, I'm not against red meat, it's not a problem, but lots of vegetables, you know, get rid of the refined carbohydrates. Um, and exercise, even if you haven't exercised, it's never too late to start. Moderate exercise starting even in midlife was associated with a 39% reduction in developing cognitive impairment. So, um, you know, all, these are simple things that you can do every day. You know, exercise, drink water, try to be aware of what you put in your body. And be aware of what the chemicals in our environment do, the antioxidants and, and you know, some basic support. If you only choose two things to, well, let's say three things to support. <laughs> let's say the gut, the adrenals, and inflammation. You know, whether it's treating the inflammation through omega-3s, you know, as a prevention, more if you have obvious inflammation in the body. Um, but, you know, there's some really basic things you can do. Um, and yes, I've mentioned a lot of products here tonight. Um, and the reason I mentioned these particular products is because not all health supplements are created equal. You know, I'm sure you've all wondered <coughs> is what I see on the label in the label, right? And that's also a hesitation as a naturopath. You know, a lot of naturopaths keep their own pharmacy because they want to know, the, you know, that the professional, they, the professional products. But if you go into your health food store and you look for Isura, and Isura certified, it has been through, ex these products have been through extensive testing. I've been to the, to the factory actually and watched and I was absolutely amazed at the level of analysis that, that they do as far as being chemical free and clean and so many of the individual ingredients are turned away Where is it? Um, in Burnaby. Uh -huh. um, so just look for that that can help you know you know that you're choosing something that you know that you know what you're getting and there's one thing that I think is really important well Lots of things that's important to remember, but um, I first wrote about the attitude of gratitude in my first book in the 1990s, just because it makes sense. You know, where is your attitude? I used to have all my patients um, write down every negative thought they had, just for one day. And I remember, I'll never forget this one patient, and her main complaint was fatigue. And she phoned my receptionist after about, oh, I'd seen her for the first visit, three or four hours. And she said, it's only been three or four hours, and I've had 236 negative thoughts. <laughs> and I thought, no wonder you're so tired. <laughs> but, you know, the attitude of gratitude, there's been a study done on it now. And it's been linked with better health, sounder sleep, less anxiety and depression, higher long-term satisfaction with life, and very important, a kinder behavior towards others. So that's something that doesn't cost anything, you know. And stress is all on our perception as well. You know, not just our physiological reaction, it's our perception. If we think something is going to be stressful, then we, we create that response in the body in and out of our own thinking. Um, so just be aware of that. And um, if there's any questions, and what I'll say is if you want more detail on any of the subjects I've covered tonight, it's, there, it's available in much detail, more than you probably want, um, in the book, in my new book. Okay? Um, any questions? Uh, yes. Falling asleep is not an issue. It's staying asleep and getting really deep sleep. What is the most likely culprit, and what can I do about it? What time, what time do you wake up? I don't pay attention to the clock because I don't want to wake up my, my brain. But maybe two or three times a night I wake up. You see cortisol. I love it because I can fall back to sleep. But since I turned 40, I'm now 47, I haven't achieved that deep, bare sleep that I used to Yeah. Well it could be, well, at your age, it could be a lot of things. It could be hormonal. Remember, I talked about the added stress on the adrenal. If, if people are hypersecreting cortisol, and cortisol increases at night where it should be low, then that releases glycogen. From, which is storage sugar. Yes. So then you're secreting more storage and it wakes the brain up. Your brain's awake. Okay. okay. What can I do to become a bear? Again? Become what? Oh, a bear. Um, well, what, I've been talking about adrenal support. Yeah. 
Um, maybe do something like um, GABA during the day just to stop that over secretion of cortisol, ideally at night. And you could try, you know, some of it, a sleep, a natural sleep remedy that might push you into sort of less, you know, calm the adrenals a little bit, whether it's restful sleep or, you know, whatever you find that works for you. Uh, well, that's a really good question, actually. Um, in my book, I show a graph. And the tests that they do in Western medicine for the adrenal only detect the extreme, like it's like a bell curve, okay? And there's this extreme side on either side, hyperadrenal, okay, which is Cushing's disease, or hypoadrenal, which is Addison's disease. But there is this whole curve. Like, let's just say it's this much out here, and then there's this whole part here that can be adrenal compromised. And there's a, that's right, just like thyroid. And there's a very small area that's optimal for adrenal. Um, so no, the answer to that is no. But what can, it's a ex more expensive test, but salivary hormone tests. Uh, salivary cortisol tests, which uh, cortisol goes in rhythms, like a diurnal <laughs> rhythm, and it should be lower at night and higher at different parts of the day. The salivary test will give you um, those levels. And I don't know how much it is, but it might be worth it, or there is a questionnaire. And I know as a naturopath, um, I would run the salivary uh, cortisol with some of my patients, but some people were just so obvious you know, just symptomatology that I would just treat because it can hurt. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Is some um, no? Go ahead. Thyroid medication. Can you actually get a prescription medication that um, addresses the T3 and T4? Yes. The question was with thyroid. Can you actually get a thyroid medication that addresses both T3 and T4? There's different ways of doing that. Desiccated thyroid is a um, prescription of choice for thyroid by most naturopaths that has contains T4 and T3. Um, it's usually made from porcine, like um, pig glandular. Um, or you can take T4, so level thyroxine, with T3, cytomel. Uh, level, thyro level thyroxine is the common uh, or Synthroid, okay, right. okay, Synthroid, um, or is T4, right. but you could also get your doctor to add Cytomel, T3, if, but only if, your T3 is low. Like I take, I take desiccated, I've been on thyroid since my late 40s, and I've taken desiccated ever since, and it's worth it. That's another good question. Can you ever go off of thyroid medication? Um, I, would, um, I would say if you've been on a thyroid prescription, no matter what it is, more than six months or a year, chances are no. And the reason for that is if, you, if somebody is doing the work of the thyroid gland, if, if you've got somebody cleaning your house, why would you get off the couch? Right? you're gonna get lazier and lazier. And that's the same with any hormone that you take because the organ that secretes that hormone no longer has to do the work. So it's very, very difficult to get off of thyroid hormone once you've been on it. Huh? Is it the same for support No, because it's not a hormone. If you were on a cortisol, low-dose cortisol, yes. If you're taking more than the physiological dose, like your adrenals put out about 20 milligrams a day, okay? So most corticosteroids that people take for inflammation and things like that are much higher doses. So it really shuts down the adrenals. And so that's why they have to titrate or wean you down from corticosteroids so your adrenals don't go into failure, all right? But if you're taking stuff to support your adrenals, whether it's Adrenosense or some of the other adrenal support out there, that's just giving your adrenals food it needs. In fact, it'd probably be upset at you if you withdrew it. Can men take the Adrenosense? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely.